production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. This time on Broad and High, we meet an artist who wants us to think and not just react to his work. Experience unique works of art that create a whole new world. Learn about proof sheets that display all the images from a roll of film. And listen to another great song that is full of life, love, and good vibes. This and more right now on Broad and High. Welcome to Broad and High. I'm your host, Kate Quickle. Marcus Blackwell is a lot of things. He's a superhero illustrator, an abstract expressionist, and an artist who feels like all reactions to art are valid. We visited Marcus in his 400 West Rich space and talked about his work. I have a studio at 400 West Rich. This is a building filled with artists for artists. And as great old buildings go, it's an industrial space, so you are kind of at the mercy of <laughs> the noises of, a, of an industrial space. But it's really nice to have a space that's dedicated to creating and thinking about creation. This space for me has turned into um, sort of a forum, you know, for this, this art life that I keep coming back to. I went to work for a large corporation, I'm not going to name them, but I had gotten to this point around my 20th anniversary about maybe not necessarily a midlife crisis, but just trying to figure out where am I at. And during those years, yeah, I was still, I was still doing art, but I guess I wasn't necessarily taking it as seriously as I should have, you know. So I just sort of like thought, you know, let's see if you can make a go of, of this art thing, you know, make a life out of it. I left that company in December 2019, and then, blam, the pandemic hits. You know, and now it's like, ooh. I started off wanting to be an illustrator, and I thought what I wanted to do was draw comic books. And in recent years, I started gravitating more towards digital, mainly because I could tell quick little stories that were illustrative for people to understand, for me to understand. Then the pandemic hits, and superheroes don't matter much anymore. You're dealing with all these different emotions and ideas that don't necessarily uh, lend themselves to that illustrative thing anymore. But then I started gravitating towards abstract expressionism and, and abstract work, and that dealt more with the inner stuff, the things that you really can't explain in words, that you can't explain in a single representational image. The abstract for me was emotion on the page, you know, and that's my emotion. How you might deal with it might be different, but it just seemed to have a whole lot more possibilities in order to explore those emotions that I had inside me that were a little bit hard or difficult to explain. The thing I think that's true for me and true for most artists is that we're always processing we're always taking things in and we might not be able to express what we're processing at the time, but eventually, you know, it, it, it'll come out in the work that you're doing. This is an exercise where I'm, 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 I'm employing not only painting, but collage work. I started off with um, just basic shapes in, in, in acrylic paint and then overlaying um, some printed papers in various shapes to kind of get some texture going. Uh, and then painting over that. So the whole process is paint, gel medium, collage, paint, mask, with like, actually cut out some mask here to actually protect some pieces that are underneath. Once it's all finished and I remove these masks and this tape, you've got an underpainting underneath. And then since I'm interested basically in, in just seeing where it goes, 
see where it goes after that. So now I'm kind of at this place where I'm trying to get into this practice of doing the work for the sake of the work and not necessarily for an explicit purpose or for a specific gaze, just coming in here and doing the work. And it's been really liberating in terms of the fact that I don't have a plan. Just come in and do it, see what happens with it, and then we'll go from there. And then you'll learn from this and then you'll, you'll move forward. So the two pieces are called Uptown and Downtown. Um, another part of the whole, the whole idea has to do with suburbia and, and, and urban life. I love urban life. A lot of the process starts for me with abstract art with an idea, particularly a color. Uh, and I'm always thinking about symbolism and how to actually infer symbols in the work that they aren't necessarily recognizable, but you see them and your brain is automatically going to latch on to them. We like to latch on to patterns in our symbols, uh, and they take on different meaning for whoever's viewing it. I just wanted a piece that had all of that, where there was nothing else that you can actually contrast it against. You just have to deal with all the symbolism in one piece and let that speak to you. I prefer to work small, mainly because I want you to come to the painting. I want you to walk up on it and let it reveal. I think sometimes when you're talking about a bigger piece, you can stand from afar and make your judgment about it because it's there. You don't, have to, you don't have to go up and ask it what it's doing. But when there's smaller pieces, you know, I've always tried to cram as much information as I can that it catches your eye and you want to know more about it, so you're going to actually come to it. I like to incorporate these huge mosaics of symbols into illustrative work as well. And I did a series of those where it was the same repeating symbols throughout. And the symbols were supposed to be like a footnote as to what's going on with this particular picture. Again, trying to connect the illustrative to, to the abstract has always been kind of my, um, my goal. How do you get both of them to kind of, not necessarily say the same thing, but to say the same thing that you want them to say. When I don't do anything else, it's, 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 it's me sitting at the coffee room table with a Sharpie or, or a micron pit. The thing that actually got me out of the funk of the pandemic were these, because they were so meditative. I could sit for hours and just start with a line and see where it goes. And I had to worry about this, just let the line tell me what it wanted to do, you know? And when I think about those, I think about the idea of why I started doing this in the first place. It's like you let these images come out of you. It's not the other way around. You let them come out of you. You know, you let them be what they're going to be. And I know that kind of sounds hokey, but there's really some, a lot of truth to the idea that the line will tell you where it wants to go, you know, uh, and you have to kind of follow along with it. I've always thought of art as a, as, as a way to work out problems. It's problem solving. The minute you decide that you want to paint something, you've actually presented yourself with a problem that you want to solve. And I think viewing art, in many ways, can also be problem solving. And that's something that's specific to the viewer. You know, If I did this and you come in and you see this, and I didn't intend those necessarily, that says something about what's going on with the viewer. I had a best friend who used to, you know, he hated hated my, he didn't hate it, but he just like, I just wish you'd go back to drawing superheroes because I don't understand his abstract stuff, you know, I just really don't, you know. He goes, and I think that when I see it, you know, I'm supposed to understand it, and I don't, so I don't like feeling that way. And I said, well, you know, that's valid. That's a valid reaction, you know. All that you've said is valid. You didn't, it doesn't mean that you have to like it. You can absolutely hate it, but it's up to you to figure out why you hate it. And it's up to you to figure out those emotions behind the hate. Bottom line, I'm trying to get people to think. You know, a lot of people are just reacting and not understanding why they're reacting to things. And I think that if we had more thought behind how we're feeling, if we exercise thinking about more how we're feeling, some of the answers would be revealed to us.
let's face it, art is about a community, you know, about reaching out to your community, engaging with your community through this avenue of visual art, but bringing people together in terms of presenting them things that get their brains thinking about how the world works. So for me, I'm looking forward to the idea of being able to kind of engage more with people than I haven't, haven't before. Just sitting around, meeting people, talking to people, talking to other artists, and just getting this to this point where we've got a community of diverse individuals who are interested in asking those questions, you know, instead of settling for these answers. It's a good place to be right now. To see more of Marcus's work and his latest creations, find him on Instagram at Blackwell Marcus. In this next story, we meet an artist who is also a social media influencer. Sarah Hambly has coupled her experience as a photographer with the inspirational landscapes she finds in Reno, Nevada to capture her unique creations. Let's take a look. Hi, my name is Sarah Hambly and I am a social media content creator slash internet influencer. So a social media influencer is basically like a marketing team slash personality online. So I do everything from getting a brand deal to setting up all the products to taking all the pictures and then pushing it on to an audience that would enjoy it. So my art form that I create in is I sew on the internet. I teach DIY tutorials. I make things from really beautiful fabrics and I make things from bed sheets or bags. I got into sewing in a really kind of roundabout weird way. I have my degree in photography. I was working as a photo editor in Los Angeles and my dad passed away really suddenly. It was suggested to channel my grief into something totally new, you know, so I didn't just go to work, come home, cry type of situation. So I picked up sewing through that. The conception of the project starts with usually finding inspiration either in my mind or from like a television show or from movies and then it goes down on paper. Sometimes the idea is so clear that I don't need to put it on paper. And then comes a process of like, do I already have a pattern that I've made that I can modify to make this dress or do I have to start from scratch? Most dresses that I create can be anywhere from a few hours to many months. This one behind me, this was three or four days to do, mostly because I had to really accommodate the beadwork on there. So it really depends on like the complexity level of what I'm doing. My social media journey is kind of your typical like overnight type situation. I wanna say October 2019 is when I like really started to focus on posting the dresses I made. Cause before then I wouldn't share them. A friend of mine got me into TikTok, filming the process and everything. And it just kind of snowballed from there. around March 2020 when the pandemic started, I had a lot of free time, as most people did. And so I decided to try and remake Ariana Grande's Grammy dress that she wore that year. And I thought that'd be really fun to like attempt to remake. So I did part one and I ended up with 35 million views pretty much overnight and went from like 100,000 followers to one and a half million. The impact of social media these days is huge. I didn't realize that it's its own industry. I used to sew for other people. I used to do commissions and wedding dresses and I did Miss Nevada Rodeo. 
when I started posting on social media and gained a following, I gained a new career. This dress here was inspired by what's called royalty core, which is an aesthetic online. I was really inspired by like the, the whole concept of like flowing gowns and running through castles and those kind of, you know, imagery that you get in your mind. When I do photograph these, I try and create a whole world, like a whole concept. So it's not just the dress, it's like props, it's the backdrop. I will do like photo shoots around Reno and I'll go to like parks or I'll go and like hike a trail. And I did one down in Davis Creek campground area where I had like a girl on a horse in the dresses and people just loved it. I think we live in a really beautiful, unique ecosystem here. Having the ability to share both the desert and the mountains within relative posts online. So like I could go and do something in the desert and then post something in the mountains. And I've only driven an hour. That's fantastic. There's like no part of the day where I don't feel like the world that I'm in is inspiring. To see more of Sarah's couture garments, find her on TikTok or Instagram at Official Hambly. Next, we visit the Cleveland Museum of Art to learn more about contact sheets. Even those of us who can remember taking pictures with something other than our phone may not know what an important part of 20th century photography these were. Let's take a glimpse into the minds and methods of the photographers featured in this exhibit. For much of the 20th century, photographers worked with contact sheets to develop and select their images. Even when contact sheets were essential and an everyday part of photography, people who were outside of the world of photography normally didn't see them because they were part of the working process. Contact sheets provide a peek at how photographers work, like in this proof of photos by Larry Fink captured at a New York gala. So we have the finished prints from this sheet, both of which are less than the full negative, but also both of which are the same square shape as the full negative. It's interesting that both of those are so tight on the emotion and action. Well, and he's, he's, he's feeling that he can make an expressive picture without basically having to have the expressions of the people's faces. It can be done through their physical gestures. Proof, photography in the era of the contact sheet, features many familiar faces, including images of Marilyn Monroe from early in her career. Philippe Palsman, who was one of the leading magazine photographers at the time, went out to Hollywood to photograph her. It was a large studio apartment, but it was still one room. And then the, this is the picture that he chose, and you see at the top there, it's the hinge on the door. It's such a great picture. It looks like one of the great Hollywood studio portraits made in the, with controlled lighting. It's in her apartment. And then, of course, when it appears on the cover of Life, they airbrush the hinge away. The exhibit includes around 180 proofs and other works collected by the late Clevelander and museum trustee, Mark Schwartz. As far as I know, nobody has ever made a collection like this before. Schwartz's wife, Bettina Katz, says her husband's collection began with one contact sheet in 2002. And that image was of Deanne and Alan Arbus. I don't think the artist was of particular significance, but it was a shoot for Vanity Fair. And I remember when he bought this. And as many things in my husband's life, you know, when he gets an idea in his head or a collecting idea, and then it just took off. Did you ever think that this collection would become an exhibit? I knew he was on to something. You know, he was a really smart man, and he started to pursue artists to create images for him, not just those that were used in the darkroom. He 
had an idea about this. So, no, I'm actually not very surprised that it's an exhibition. What is surprising to me is the interest around this kind of nostalgia look back at film photography. One of Schwartz's special requests of an artist was for Richard Avedon to enlarge a contact sheet from his photo shoot with the actor Groucho Marx. After Avedon had agreed to make these for Mark, Mark proposed to him, well, would you consider making a big one, like six feet tall? And eventually, Avedon agreed. Was that a common thing? No, completely uncommon. Although, you know, Avedon had been one of the people who pioneered very large prints, but of individual frames not of a contact sheet, even though he included contact sheets in his exhibitions, but not that size. I think it was part, partly the reason he said yes was because he was interested. He was interested in the contact sheet as a, as a trace of the photographer's process, working process. So he did agree, but there's only one of those. Yeah, and then it's right there and at it's the, end of the yeah. end of the show. Visit clevelandart.org for information about their current and upcoming exhibitions. In our next installment of Broad and High Presents, we hear a song by the Floorwalkers. Your Way combines elements of classic rock with 60s soul. Take a listen. The bad weather out when lines are down and life isn't fair. Yeah. The song was you see and do, and you know I believe in you, and you know I will always be there. Oh, you can do what you want to do, and say what you need to say. No, I won't try to drive your car, no, I won't get in your way. With you, no matter what, we'll take the world, baby. It up. We're riding up to shine through the dark oh. We're in this together now, baby Let's do what we do and go crazy We're moving all the mountains apart oh. I'll really good to you I'll do all the things that I should for you When lines are down and life is unfair yeah. There's so much to see and do You know I believe in you You know I will always to bring you down, down. You know, I know that you are a star. Your light is in the light on the town. You can do what you want. Well, that's our show. Remember, you can find all of our stories online at WOSU.org, as well as on our YouTube channel. For all of us here at WOSU, I'm Kate Quickle. Thanks for watching.
Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com.